What's up guys, thanks very much for joining me. Welcome along today. Uh, today we're gonna to be looking at some suspension basics on motorcycles and doing a few changes and modifications before an upcoming track day. So we've got a 2012 Yamaha R1. If you don't know the full spec of this bike, I'll pop a link in the description, have a watch of that video. Uh, it's been out on track a couple of times. I've encountered a couple of problems with the front feeling very, very soft and the fork travel indicator actually going all the way down. The only way stopping that with full preload wound on is to up the compression. So we're gonna make a spring change and a fork wheel change in the front. And on the rear, I'm not happy with the rear tire wear. It seems to be a bit soft to me, potentially a bit too much rebound. So we are gonna also do a spring change on the rear and take some of the preload out of the spring. But before we do any of that, I'm gonna very, very quickly run over motorcycle basics of suspension for anyone who doesn't know, and then we'll get into the job. So let's start here at the front of the bike and let's start talking about actual bike geometry. So the most important thing to talk about is rake and trail. If we imagine a vertical line down through the wheel spindle and then a diagonal line through the headstock, where the vertical line intersects the diagonal line at the top is known as a rake angle. That's a manufacturer's specification on the frame. If we imagine the diagonal rake angle line going all the way to the ground and the horizontal line, the trail is the distance below the wheel between these two points. This is normally measured in inches and is responsible for the cast or self-centering action of the steering. So they're the main geometries of the front end of the bike. Anything you do to the front end is going to affect your rake and trail and that is what changes the way the bike handles. So something like this, like a sports bike, will have a very short trail, which means it's got fast, agile handling, but can be uh, a bit unstable. If you look at something like a cruiser or a chopper with long bars, you're gonna have a long trail, very, very um, planted and stable, but won't turn very quickly. Moving up to the top of the bike, some race bikes do have an adjustable headstock here to change the rake and trail angle of the bike. However, that's not very common. What is common is the offset of the yoke. So we take the offset of the yoke is the center line of the spindle to the center line of the forks. If you change the triple clamps or the yokes at the top, you can get different offsets, again, affecting the rake and the trail. Uh, ride height of the bike. Some people like to measure this from the top yoke to the top of the fork cap, and they will say that they've dropped the yokes or dropped the forks through the yokes or pulled the forks up. I prefer to measure it from the bottom yoke here down to the center line of the axle and use that as my ride height reference, mainly because uh, if you change the forks and you've got different length forks, you're still actually measuring the accurate ride height rather than just the fork length at the top. Lowering the front of the bike will make it steer quicker, raising the front of the bike will make it steer slower but give you more stability. Inside these fork tubes, we've got springs. Some of these are progressively wound, which is where the spring rate will actually increase the more it compresses, but the majority of them are linear, where it's got the same rate for the whole compression of the spring. This is something we'll be changing, so we'll have a look at that later. We've also got the air gap, or the fork oil height inside the top of the spring. This is for the last, say, bottom third of the stroke of the fork. Again, that's something we're gonna change later, so we'll talk a bit more about that. Adjustments to the forks, we've got preload, which is where you preload the spring, you put tension onto the spring. One of the reasons we're changing these springs is because this was having to use maximum preload to get the correct sag setting. Then we've got compression and rebound, which is the damping, which helps to control the spring rate. If we didn't have the damping, the spring would just be bouncing all over the place. So the compression obviously controls that spring rate in the compression phase and the rebound as it's extending. We'll have a look at the shock absorber later on with the spring off to show you a bit more about how that's operating. Moving backwards from the bike, we've got the wheelbase, which is from the center line of the front axle to the center line of the rear axle. Shorter wheelbase, quicker steering, less stable, longer wheelbase, the opposite. So moving on to the rear of the bike, this is where things can get a little bit more complicated. Here we've got a mono shock fitted, which is a single shock absorber with the spring over the top. You can also get twin shocks like these Olins here. And again, you can see here, this is actually a progressively wound spring where the windings change along the length of the spring. So we've also got the ride height on the rear of the bike, which on this shock absorber is adjustable by cracking off this lock nut and lengthening or shortening the eyes, eye to eye point of the shock length. If you haven't got that, what you can do is actually remove the mounting point of the shock absorber and place shims 
twin this or remove shims to change the ride height at the rear of the bike. We've also got our compression and rebound adjusters and we've got a remote preload adjuster on here which is hydraulically operating this component here to preload the spring. Now if you haven't got a remote preload adjuster this is a far more common arrangement where you have these two lock nuts where you crack the lock nut off of the C-span at the top and adjust the lower one to change the preload onto the spring. The swing arm pivot point is the point at which the swing arm interacts with the chassis and pivots from. The rear suspension linkage is this guy down here. This is fitted with uh, motorcycles with monoshock suspensions and is crucial in providing either a linear stroke through the whole length of the shock so it feels the same all the way through or a rising rate so it gets stiffer as it compresses or a reducing rate where it gets softer. Anti-squat is the effect of the swing arm being pushed away from the bike as you're accelerating and the bike is trying to squat down on the back. To try this out, you can sit at the traffic lights with the front brake on, put it in first gear and just pull the clutch out a little bit and you'll feel the back of the bike actually lifting up. That is the effect of anti-squat. Anti-squat is a combination of swing arm pivot point, chain length, gearing, linkage ratio, and a little bit of black magic in there just to add it all into the equation. So to be honest with you, to really set the rear end of the bike up accurately and make changes that you know what you're changing with it, you need some form of proper data logging equipment on there. So when thinking about motorcycle suspension, you need to try and imagine it as an aeroplane really, where it's pitching forwards and squatting backwards and leaning left and right, and all that weight transfer that's occurring all the time. So you also need to try and remember that the front end of the bike is for corner entry to apex and the rear end of the bike is more for apex to exit. For instance. So that's a very quick basic overview of suspension geometry and terminology. Today we are going to change the front springs, the air gap, the rear spring and then reset the sag as the issues were we were having to fully wind the preload on to get the correct sag numbers. So in case you hadn't noticed, I'm not actually Giacomo Agostini guys, so I can't ride this bike to the limit of the grip of the tyres, which is the limiting factor. However, if I know the suspension is set up correctly, it's correct for my weight and it's working as it should do, it should inspire confidence and the feeling you need to get faster and improve your lap times. If you're interested in really delving into the physics behind motorcycle suspension, I will pop a link in the description to a book by Tony Fole, which really does go into depth about all different kinds of motorcycle suspension. I will also pop in a little, a little data sheet that I've made up so that when you're going out doing your track days, you can make little changes and record it so you know what, where you are with the bike. So over here on the bench, we've got the rear shock absorber out. Hopefully you can see here these numbers, 55, 155, 100. That indicates an internal diameter on this KTX spring of 55 mil, a, th a free spring length of 155 mil, and a spring rate of 100 newtons. So the problem we were having with this was that to get the correct sag figure, which we will be setting up later on once we've changed all these components, if you want to know how to do that, was to get the correct figure, we had to, um, wind all the preload on, which is up to 20 turns of preload. Each turn is equivalently equivalent to one mil. So we're looking at 20 mil of preload on this spring to get the correct sag figure. Coupled to that, the free spring length might be 155 mil, as hopefully we can see there. However, when it's fitted into the shock absorber, even with no preload on it, you will still compress the spring slightly giving us a spring length of 148 mil. So plus the 20, we've actually got 27 mil of preload on this spring to get the correct sag figure. So we are going to increase the spring rate slightly to a 105. And whilst we've got the spring off and the shock out, great opportunity to service our rear linkage, remove it, clean out the old needle roller bearings, re-grease the needle roller bearings, job that's often overlooked, and also check the operation of the shock absorber without the spring fitted. Now, if you fitted a longer spring, 160 mil spring, to try and achieve the same effect here, you would potentially achieve the same thing with not needing to put as much preload on. However, what you'll end up doing is coil binding the spring where the spring will actually be fully compressed and coil bound together before the shock absorber has reached the limit of its stroke. So always try and keep the spring length the same. So let's get it loaded up in the Spring Flinger 3000. This is just a homemade compressor tool, a bit of old 40 mil oak worktop, some galvanized electrical conduit, some little caps and some holes drilled in, some retaining pins, 
cheap bottle jack with a nut threaded on the end of it and a small piece of lead to protect the end of the shock absorber and a piece of steel cut out with some holes and a bit of rubber matting on the bottom. Now once we've got the circle clip exposed, we can pop that off and release the spring. Now with the spring off, it's a great opportunity to inspect your shock absorber, check around the seal for any leaks, any wear and tear, damage to the shaft, etc. Give it a really nice clean whilst you're in there. And don't forget, you're not just cleaning to make it look pretty, you're cleaning it to then inspect it afterwards. Whilst the, the spring is off, we'll talk a little bit about damping control. So on this shock here, the black clicker or adjuster is the compression damping. The natural color one is the rebound. And because this is a race shock, we've actually got a lot more adjustment on this than we would have on a standard road shock. So on a standard road shock, typical fully in to fully out would be approximately three turns. And the compression adjuster doesn't do a lot on a road shock. It's all to do with the rebound adjuster, which is on the bottom of the shock and how that controls the oil flow through the bypass. So because this has got more adjustment on it, it basically gives you more control and more finer tuning of that damper. As a quick demonstration, we will wind the compression and the rebound fully in. So what this is, is as the oil is trying to bypass the valves, it's closed off. So it's making it very, very difficult for the oil to bypass. And you should be able to see there, it's very, very hard to compress. And very, very slow to come back out on the rebound. Whereas if we wind them all the way out, like so, you can see nice smooth compression, nice smooth rebound. So you should always set your compression and rebound from fully in, wind them fully closed and count the amount of clicks out. And the preload should always be the opposite. You wind it all the way off and count the amount of turns in. So the spring fling has done its job, we're ready to go back in. Always try and fit the spring with the spring rate visible when the shock's back in the bike so you can see what spring rate is on there. And also make sure you've got it the right way up in case it is a progressively wound spring. Linkage is all serviced and ready to go back in. If you've not had these off before and you're not sure which way they go on, just make a little arrow, take a picture first before you take it apart. Uh, bike's all minty fresh, nice and clean in there and under there, ready to go. So we're gonna drop the shock back in. Then move on to the front. Now to, it is worth noting to take the shock out of a bike, you will need to support it from the midpoint of the bike. So I've got these beautiful factory Harris stands here. If you haven't got a set of those, you can use an ABBA stand, which goes through the frame, or even a long bar through there on axle stands. You can obviously get proper peg stands. Um, some people put things through the frame, but just know it has to be supported. If you haven't got these solid foot pegs, you need to support the frame as the rear paddock stand isn't actually doing anything at the minute, the wheel will 
flop up and down. So always remember that. And always remember as well, every little adjustment you make will affect something else on the bike. It's the same with any setup on any vehicle. Change one thing, you're always chasing your tail and it's always a compromise. So for instance, if we put less preload on this rear shock, then it may also change the sag setting on the front as it's changed the weight distribution slightly. So as long as you understand the principles of what you're trying to achieve and what you're adjusting and doing, you can have a play around with it yourself. Um, everybody's still learning. I don't know everything by far. So if you're not sure and you're not confident, always seek professional advice. Anyway, let's get the shock back in there and then we will pop these forks out. So we don't actually need to take these forks out to change the springs. They are race forks, so you can change the springs by just lowering the front with the fork still in. But because we want to do an oil level change, we need to have the fork vertically upright so we can get an accurate measurement of the oil. So we'll see you over at the bench once these are out. So we've got the fork out and we're over here at the vise. Important when you clamp a fork, never clamp it directly in the vise without soft jaws and don't clamp the tube too hard because you don't want to deform the tube. So she's nicely clamped in there. Also, wind the preload fully off before you remove it and crack the top cap before you take it out of the bike. A few little tips there. So in here, we've got the spring damper assembly. On this motorcycle, because these are race forks, you can, like I say, change the springs in there. What we've got is we've got a rebound leg and a compression leg. Each one does the rebound or the compression individually. Rebound on the right, in this case. So we've pulled this fork out of the bike because we are changing the air gap and the spring in there. So what we were having to do was wind the preload on to get the correct sag setting. So when you're setting the sag, which we'll do afterwards, it's to get the suspension working in the correct range. And what was happening was to get that supported at the correct range, we were winding it all the way on. So we need a slightly heavier weight spring. In there at the minute is a 10 Newton spring. And over here, we've got some 10.5s to go in on the top there. Now at the top of the fork, we also have an air gap, which operates like an air spring on the last third stroke of the fork. So I believe the oil level at the minute in there, when we measured from the top, is 220 millimeters down. So that's the air gap or the fork oil height. Normally measured, fully compressed, and the spring and the spacer out of it. So we'll be changing that. We're gonna take that up to about 190 or 200 and give that a try. Hopefully on this graph, you can see as the air gap changes, and the more oil you have in the fork, the harder it is to compress in the last third of the stroke. These forks also have these cap extenders on. That is to allow more adjustment range with the fork in the bike. You might think you're never ever gonna to wanna to, uh, raise the front of the bike that much, but if you raise the front of the bike, you could also then raise the rear of the bike so you keep the geometry the same, but the center of gravity is higher, the ride height's higher, potentially to get ground clearance, or to get more pitch on the motorcycle to get weight transfer more. So that's why these little cap extenders are on. So these are already cracked off. So we'll remove the top cap. We need to double check the oil level in the fork and make an adjustment. So with the fork leg fully compressed, the spring and the preload space around, we can actually see it's got a fork oil height there of 210 mil or an air gap of 210 mil. So to set this fork oil height, we could just pour the fork oil in and keep measuring with the steel rule until we get it just where we want. You Or you can buy a fork oil height tool. Now, if you've watched any of the channel or you've seen from the Springer Flinger, I do like to look around a workshop and see what I can knock up. So here is my own fork oil height tool, just a piece of alley, a metal straw, a bit of carburetor, a fuel hose with a syringe on. So we can now pour the brake, uh, the, not brake fluid, definitely not. We can pour the fork oil into the fork. Doesn't matter how much we pour in. And then we pop this down. In fact, what we'll do is we will set it to the right height first. So we want 190 millimeters. So we can move that down to there. Now we can pop that in the fork. 
and then suck on the syringe and it will remove any excess fork oil and we just keep doing that until we're no longer sucking oil and just sucking air now our height should be set to 190 millimeters so we're happy with the fork oil height in this now now we need to replace the spring so hopefully you can see there that was a 10 newton spring in there we are up in that slightly to a 10.5 and hopefully we'll be able to get the sag setting correct without having to use all of the preload adjustment so don't forget to put your spacer back in and also the correct orientation and put your fork back together There we go, fork ready to go back in the bike with new oil level, new spring. Don't forget, we need to talk the top cap up once it's in. So we do the same with the other fork, exactly the same process. Remember to put the correct fork in the right side if they're like these forks with rebound and compression in separate legs. And then we'll get on and set up the sag. So the bike's all back together and looking like a motorcycle again. And I've managed to cure the OCD of not having these top caps orientated the same on both sides. So that is perfect now. Now, before we go on and set the sag, we just want to talk quick talk about the compression rebound adjustment and the preload. So the preload adjuster on this is the hex nut in there, if you can see that. And the three mil Allen key in the middle on this side is compression, on that side is rebound. So the damping settings, um, that's totally personal preference. That is down to the rider, how quick they are, where they're riding, the conditions, blah, blah, blah. A lot of manufacturers will specify somewhere in between in a middle setting. Um, so these have got 30 clicks of adjustment or range. Uh, so a good starting point would be somewhere sort of 12 to 15 clicks. And remember, always set these from fully in to out. The preload, you always set from fully out to in. So as an example, these have got 30 clicks, three clicks of adjustment on this because these are race forks will make very, very minor difference. If we look at this Rode GSXR here, we can see this is quite a standard fork setup on a road bike. We've got preload adjustment on the blue, anodized blue nut there, rebound adjustment in the middle on the flat and compression adjustment down here on the bottom of the fork leg. So on this, each fork does compression and rebound. Some newer shower big piston forks have got compression and rebound at the top. It's totally fork dependent. But if I show you on this how much difference three clicks makes, because this has only got three turns of adjustment as opposed to the 30 on the R1, you'll see why race forks are more specifically designed for what they do. So this is with the rebound fully wound off. You can see the front end's very, very springy. So we will turn it three full turns all the way in on both forks. And hopefully now you will see how slow it is to return up. So the aim of your compression and rebound adjusters is to get the bike to dive, come back up and then settle like that. So have a play around with your compression and rebound, and if you make a note of where it is to start, you can always go back to how it was. So let's go on and set the sag. For that, we are going to need two people. You're gonna need all your rider kit and some stands to hold the front of the fork or something to take the weight off of the bike so that you can measure the forks and the swing arm fully extended. So if we focus on the front first, the first thing to do is to get a fork fully extended measurement. Now you can just use a steel rule like this. As I've got a digital vernier gauge, I prefer to use one of them, a little bit more accurate. And I also like to go to the metal part of the fork leg rather than the rubber seal so that you know you're getting an accurate measurement. And we need to get a fully extended measurement of that fork leg. So here we hopefully can see 129.3, 129 millimeters. So we need to write that down. That's our fully extended reading. What we then do 
is we will take the weight off of the front of the bike, bounce it a few times and let it settle, take the same reed in, and that will give be your static sag. The static sag is the weight, is the sag, the amount that the suspension's compressed under just the weight of the bike. Now, hopefully we'll get a read in somewhere between 25 to 30 mil static sag on the front, and then we will get on with our kit, keep the bike level at all times, weight off of your feet, sitting on the bike, and you'll get an assistant to measure the same gap. That will be your rider sag. And the rider sag should be, hopefully, for a track bike like this, we're aiming for around 35 millimeters. So now we've got the bike off all stands and it's lent up against the wall nice and level. We need to take another reading. And we can see we've got 98 millimeters. So fully extended reading was 128. Uh, static sag reading was 98, which means we've got a static sag of 30 millimeters and we've only got five mil of preload wound on there at the top. That's much, much better. Before we had to have all the 20 mil preload wound on to get this same reading. So the new fork springs appear to be doing the job. Now I'll get kitted up, get on the bike and do the same, get an assistant to do the same reading and see what that comes out at. So with that all complete, we've got a reading of 92.64. So, our original figure of 128 millimetres minus 92.6 or 92 gives us a rider sag reading of approximately 36 millimetres. So with the preload set nicely with just 5 mil, we've got the correct rider and the correct static sag for me to take this on track. Now for the rear, you're going to have to get the bike back up on your peg stands, ABBA stand, whatever you're using, so that the rear wheel is free, not on the stand. If you haven't got peg stands or fold up pegs or an ABBA stand, you can actually use the side stand of the bike. Simply grab the pinion foot peg and lever it over onto the side stand while somebody else measures the extended swing arm. So with the swing arm fully extended, you need to find a fixed point on either the bodywork or the top of the bike and the swing arm. And using a tape measure, you need to take a read in from that point to the top in as vertical a line as you can. So this up to this mark up here on the tail fairing is 677 millimeters. So the bike back on its wheels, uh, we've got the preload set to 10 mil. We've uh, bounced the bike, settled the bike down. We will take another reading. Remember we had 677 to begin with. And we are now reading 665. So that gives us exactly 12 millimeters of static sag. So that is perfect for what we want. And we're still only halfway through the preload adjustment. So now we'll do the same thing with the rider sag, put the kit on and check out what that reads. Now with that reading complete, we got 650 millimeters. So our original 677 fully extended, Minus 650 gives us 27 millimetres rider sag. So we're looking for between 10 to 12 mil static and between 25 and 30 mil rider sag on this track bike. On the road, you're going to go a little bit more, you're going to run it a little bit softer. So now the front and the back are set up lovely with only half of the preload adjustment used on the rear and only five turns on the front. Slightly stiffer springs and the fork oil change. So all that's left to do is get out on track and see if we like with the changes that we've made. <sighs> Cheers. Thanks very much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and don't miss when it's out on track and I'll give you a bit of feedback on what I think of the suspension changes. Look after yourselves, take care, and we'll see you next time. Ta-ta.